Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again talking to you guys. So, and we're talking about diseases of homes today, so I hope you're going to like it. Um, I get that is probably the most common thing that I get in the lab. I get tons and tons of home samples, especially Phoenix Canariensis. Usually coming from landscape companies, you know, who are working on somebody's trees and they want to know, are we going to have to take this out? You know, does it have one of those awful fatal diseases? So, and I brought examples of some of them. These are actual samples from the lab. So, you know, feel free to come up and hang out and, and check them out. A couple of them aren't palms. That's um, our malaria on viburnum, but they were just such cool samples that I had to bring them because you've got the mycelium, the mycelial plaque just peeling right off here. So, and then um, for those mushroom fans, I just got in yesterday a weird little thing called an earth vase. And it's these little dark things right here. You can look at them real close, but they're fibrous. And they're, you know, they don't look like much mushroom-wise, but they're mycorrhizal, so they're good guys for the plants. So if you see them, and the, in this case, the, the guy thought that they were killing the lawn. And I'm like, no, they're not killing your lawn. <laughs> they're coming up because they're mushrooms, because it's really wet. But they aren't the things killing your lawn. They're just help, helping your pine trees grow. So, OK. So back to palm tree diseases. So these are all things that, you know, this isn't comprehensive of all diseases of palms everywhere, but these are things that I do see fairly commonly here in the lab. So um, I'm going to talk about the disorders first, and which are problems that are not caused by a living agent. And uh, so that first one right here, that is, um, that was a palm tree in Oceanside I went to look at. Somebody called and said, ah, I think it's got something terrible. You know, the top just snapped right off and died. And I, I, I took a gazillion samples off of that one and got no diseases out of it. So I'm thinking that that one was just neglect. It was on an empty lot in Oceanside, it hadn't been watered, it hadn't been cared for, and I think the poor thing just kind of gave up the ghost and snapped. And uh, the guy who called me was real excited because he wanted to buy the lot. <laughs> he was like, yeah, the tree's gone, now I can build them. <laughs> but um, we get a lot of strange things too. I call that one ladder leaf. You know, there's your normal looking leaf right next to it here, and there's a a weird one, that's a nutrient deficiency. That's probably boron deficiency. So that means it's hungry. You know, the, the, the leaf when it was forming did not get enough of the right nutrients. And then you got this one I just threw in for fun. <laughs> that really weird looking palm tree that isn't really a palm tree. So. How about the one to the left in that photo? Well, yeah, I think these are, again, very neglected trees. There's nothing happening there. There's no water. There's there's absolutely nothing happening to take care of those palm trees. How much water do they need? It depends on the variety, you know, or on the on the type of palm. Some need more. Some need less. And again, if those are Washingtonians, they should be able to take you know some drought, but I they don't look good. No. <laughs> so you got the artificial green one there, but. Anyway, it's, it's just fun. This was another one up in Oceanside that we got called out for. Um, we, we've been getting a lot of calls because of the publicity about the beetles, the weevils, you know, that are in trees. And I'll, I'll do them at the, at the last of the thing. I was trying to get Dr. Ellis, our entomologist here, but she couldn't make it today. But she gave me some slides. So we can talk about those evil weevils also. But. Um, this one was another case of neglect. It was a school and uh, up in the Oceanside Vista area. And these poor things, they were trying to grow all these palm trees. And if you can see the light color here too, they, were, they, had, they hadn't gotten any fertilizer. They were, they were nutrient deficient. And then they must have figured that out because then they threw a ton of fertilizer just right there on the gravel with them. I think they might have been getting a lot of water but um, they also might have had a weed whacker guy who kept coming in and taking off all the, you know, all the new roots that come out right along the edges there. Anyway, this poor thing, it was right after a windstorm, 
and um, it didn't have enough roots to hold the tree upright. It just fell right over. So, and they had a few of them at that place do it. So, you know, whether the roots were rotting off, we didn't really get any diseases out of those either. It was just another case of, I'm going to call it root pruning. Oh, and um, a lot of that stuff too, I, for a reference book, I used Don Hodel's um, Biology and Management of Landscape Palms, which is a really good book. Highly technical sometimes on the botany part. It's pretty heavy duty, but it's a cool book. So if you need another reference book, that's, that's a good one. And he's a farm advisor up in Los Angeles County. Does the same thing that Dave Shaw used to do here. So. Okay, power line decline. Palms don't like power lines. They, you know, and, and SDG and E hadn't gotten to this one yet, but they would <laughs> eventually. But um, power lines seem to stunt the growth of palm trees when they get right up there to them. So that's another thing. And um, when the when the tr uh, trunk starts cracking, that's excess water. They're just taking up too much water, and the trunks crack. That picture was from Florida, obviously, but I have seen it here. Okay, nutrient deficiencies, things that, um, and on any plant, a lack of nitrogen makes a light green color. Pretty much whatever plant you've got, you've got that nice light green, spring green color. That means it's hungry. Same, feed me, feed me. Other, other pretty common nutrient deficiencies, and in poems, Nutri around here, nutrient deficiencies are like constant. They're all the time. If you plant the tree in sandy soil, nutrients go right through the sandy soil, so it's going to need more. If it's in clay soil and it's kind of wet, the roots tend to rot, so they don't pick up the food as easily. You know, it's, they're, they're not growing as well in, in clay soil, and so palms have a consistent nutrient problem around here. So, and potassium is very common. I think you've probably all seen this, but you might not have realized it. On the Washingtonias, when you hold the leaf up to the light and you see these translucent yellow spots through, through it, that's a potassium deficiency. On the fishtail palms, it goes to brown a lot faster. These will turn brown too if it keeps up. So, and they'll look pretty bad. On Phoenix Robolini, it's a little less. Um, spotty, but they make little yellow flecks, little yellow flecks all over the leaf. Big potassium deficiency. So. Okay, another one that you can pretty much look down a row of street trees and see this one fairly easily too. Magnesium deficiency. This will be more concentrated on the older leaves, less on the younger leaves, and the edges of the leaves will be brown. And you might think it, you know, it's salt damage, because salt damage could do similar symptoms, but um, this is magnesium deficiency. Yeah. Okay, and boron deficiency does odd little crinkly things. You can see the little crinkles there and little crinkles there, so that kind of crimping and crinkly stuff that's boron deficiency. So, yes, Bob? Um, a, a lot of the fertilizers, if you get what's a complete fertilizer, it's got these micronutrients in there already. But you could actually add it, you know, with a, a very small amount of, you can buy the boron that they use for eye wash, like boric acid that they use for eye washes or that you feed your ants to kill them. <laughs> that would work too. So yeah, you don't need much. And once these, you know, once a leaf has it, it's not going to recover what you're doing is protecting the new growth that comes out. Because it's got to happen while it's forming. It's got to have that boron in there. And then frizzle top, that's what they call that one. When the top of it gets all frizzled up, kind of like my hair. Um, <laughs> that's, that's manganese deficiency, another micronutrient that you don't need a lot of. You only need a little bit. But um, so when, the, when your top of your palm is just coming out weird, and 
is probably just frizzle top from a nutrient deficiency again. All right, now we're getting into the real diseases. Yeah. When you, when you fertilize a Washington onion that's got a diameter of about two feet, two and a half feet, how far out do you do that? And what do you do when it's in a parking strip of concrete on both sides? Yeah. How far out do you fertilize? You don't have to go far, because you know, um, the roots aren't going hugely far. I would say within three feet of the trunk. So, because the roots aren't going that far out either. You know, remember when they when they dig them up to move them, it's it's not really that far. So, within three feet of the trunk would probably do it. Yeah. Is, is there a fertilizer on the market that covers all these micronutrients for pollen? And the question was, yeah, is there a fertilizer on the market that covers all the nutrient deficiencies of homes? Um, I don't know of one right on hand. Or do you just gotta kind of look and mix it up yourself? Yeah, I would. Most of the things they say complete fertilizer, they usually got the micronutrients in there. Yeah. And sometimes the micronutrients are in the soil, but because our soil pH here tends to be real alkaline, um, they're just not available, so that's why you kind of have to add a little before it gets hit by the alkalinity and goes out of solution Would it again. Help to acidify the soil a little bit? It might. If your pH is like eight and a half, nine, I bet it would. Mm -hmm. So how, how common would you say those deficiencies are? Very common. I can I can you know walk down the street pretty much and, and see some of those. You know, Balboa Avenue, I see the manganese deficiency right along them when I'm driving down Balboa. Um, yeah, very common. Yes? But pH, but pH farms require. What is the pH? What they ah, require? boy, I, I know it's in this book. <laughs> I can't remember right offhand. <laughs> but I, I, most plants, you know, like it on the slightly acid side, you know, on the six to seven range. So I would guess that palms would prefer that too, but I would have to look that up. I don't know for sure. So, okay, I saw another question there before. What is okay. the average lifespan of a healthy palm? I'm thinking oh. more like the Mexican palm. I'm hoping my neighbors die soon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that either. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know that one. We can we can give you some hints about diseases to add. <laughs> I might have some fungus that might help you out on that. There. <laughs> okay, so diseases, things caused by a living organism, and here's um, that one's the Labiopsis trunk rot. If the name of the fungus is the Labiopsis, I don't expect you to, uh, you know. Remember that exactly, but a lot of times if you see a trunk suddenly snap off or you hear about the unfortunate circumstances where suddenly the top of a palm just comes snaps off and comes crashing down and there were no other previous symptoms first, <coughs> and if the inside of the trunk is kind of dark colored, I especially look for that fungus because the fungus is dark colored and that's a really common one, especially along the coast. And um, pink rot here is really, really common. Um, again, especially along the coast because of the moisture. And um, this, this is a queen palm and it's coming right out of the trunk there. Once that one gets into the trunk of a queen palm, just take the palm out, it's gone. It's going to be dead. So it does that to kings too. It gets in the trunk and goes crazy on kings. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And I'm going way fast here, guys, so you might get out early. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the easiest disease to identify, and it only goes to Washingtonia filifera, is diamond scale. And you look at that, and it's not an insect, so the, even though the name of the disease is diamond scale. And um, you can see the black fruiting bodies this stuff, and they're kind of diamond shaped. This is actually the fungus. This is actually the spore bearing structure of the fungus. And the spores get splashed around. When it gets wet, they kind of crack open. And then the spores splash around and they'll splash up to the new growth. And that's what they're infecting first. They're fruiting on the, the older growth. 
but they're infecting the youngest, they prefer to infect the youngest, softest tissue first. And then, so then as the leaf unfolds, it gets worse and worse. And um, so it causes premature leaf loss of, 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 um, of the fronds. Yeah. So I see it, it only attacks Washingtonia. Yep. Not Phoenix Rolini. Correct. Correct. Yeah, this one only goes to Washingtonia prolifera and its hybrids. So that's why we start there. It's easy. Yeah. <laughs> but if you've got some kind of Washingtonian with diamond-shaped black things on there, yeah. It's not a scale, it's a fungus? Yes. It's called scale because... Somebody gave it that name. They... <laughs> it looks a little bit like scale. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like kind of like a, a scale kind of thing. But it's not an insect. That's the, that's the fun one you always do to a brand new entomologist in the lab who isn't familiar with Southern California. You go, hey, identify the scale insect for me. And they go, ah, <laughs> never seen an insect like this. It's not. <laughs> well, with scale insects, too, you can kind of knock them off. You know, you can, you can pick it off. This doesn't pick off. It's, it's very much attached. It's coming right out of the living tissue. Does it have to do with moisture or humidity, perhaps? Yeah, or that's when they fruit more. Near the ocean? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see that a lot more. You don't see it inland very much. You don't see it in the desert. You see it along the coast. Does it kill the tree? Eventually, yeah. It's slow, but eventually, if you keep taking off all the new growth, you know, the, like that, when, it's, when it's really infected like that, or worse, it's not photosynthesizing very well. So it's not feeding the tree the way it needs to. Yeah. Um, I looked up the palm requirements for soil. Okay. They're slightly acidic. They like 6.0 to 6.5. All right. I said 6 to 7, so oh, good. But several, 7 is neutral. Right. Right. So a little under neutral. Perfect, which is not our normal soil around here, <laughs> unless you're a decomposed granite. But most of our soils here are pretty alkaline. So. You're going to be always dealing with the nutrient deficiencies in palms. So, okay, anything else? All right, that's diamond scale. So an easy one to identify. Yes? Does trying to uh, alter your pH, does that help, or is that just a losing battle? Um, it will help a little bit, yeah. Yeah, that's, how long, do you, how long does it last for your azaleas? Yeah, there you're making it even. <laughs> You're, you're fighting an even harder battle because the zelia is like an even more acidic. But, yeah. yeah. Yes? Because it's a fungus, is there anything other than lack of less humidity that on it? Well, if you can reach it, you know, if it's a small plant and in nurseries, you can try fungicides to protect the new growth. So you can't eradicate it. Once, you know, you've got these black structures on here, they're there forever. But you can try to protect all your new growth to stop the gradual decline of the tree. So. Another picture of my tree for your lessons. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm always ready for new pictures. Yeah. Will neem oil help at all? I don't think so. I, I kind of doubt. I don't know for sure. I've never tried that, but I kind of doubt it. Usually they talk about copper-based fungicides for this. So, yeah, but I don't know what neem oil will do. I don't think it's a great fungicide. All right, this is the one. This is um, pink rot, and it goes to pretty much all the palms. It's pretty common. I've got a nice bag of it right here. So if you want to really see the color, because sometimes the pictures don't come out so well, but it attacks pretty much all parts of the palm, the trunk, the leaves. You know, the, the sheath surrounding the leaf, right there it's coming, right there it's coming right out of the trunk. So, um, and this one, so yeah, vascular discoloration, your tissue in a cross section will be dark colored. In this case, the pink rot's run away, so it's already all pink. <laughs> um, it'll get soft, it's a rot, so it's, it, the tissue's getting soft. Um, the leaves will fall off, and it does kill trees, especially queens and kings. Um, 
The name of the fungus now is Melanthamala. They keep changing it. It was originally penicillium, and then they switched it to gliocladium, and now it's Melanthamala. I remember that one because remember the cartoon, The Lion King? And, and I think wasn't Simba, you know, the, the lion cub, wasn't his girlfriend's name Nala? So that's how I remember that one. I go, okay, it's, it's Simba's girlfriend's name, Nala. <laughs> Nala. <laughs> that's, that's how I remember that one. And um, this one, spores, this is a dry, powdery spore, so they'll blow in the wind and they'll infect, you know, new, new wounds, anything like that. It's also very commonly moved on tools. So when they get your chainsaw up there and, and cut around on the tree, and if the tree they cut before yours had pink rot, this one will get it too. So I see it a lot in Oceanside, Encinitas, um, places along the coast. I see it fairly commonly. Any cure? No. <laughs> Once it's in the trunk, it's, it's gone. If you've got it in, in a nursery situation where you've got very small little plants, you know, and you can reach them very well, you can you can use a fungicide and try it and try to save them. But otherwise, if it's a big tree, the fungicides don't penetrate into the trunk. They don't circulate very well in palm trees. It's it's just not going to work very well. So, and this is a fast grower. It just it grows really fast when you've got that in a culture plate, too. It's going to didn't I have that one there? No, okay, that's coming up next. But there's the, it's coming right out of the trunk. That was a, was a queen palm. It's coming right out of the trunk there. All that, all that pink stuff. It's just erupting right out. And all the tissue beneath it is, you know, is dead. All the stuff above here, that's all dead already. Yes? As you're saying, pink rot. Mm -hmm. That looks like plain old white. Is it pink inside? Or? It is pink. No, it, it is. Well, the, the mycelium, when it's first young, is white, uh -huh. but then it, it goes pink. Uh -huh. So, and, and you can see that on this one up here. It's it's definitely pink. Is it pink in your shirt? Not quite as pink, but close. Yeah. <laughs> and this one's more of a dusty rose. <laughs> so, but it is pink. I'm sorry? What is the cause of it? It is the fungus. The, know, the fungus. How, how does it get it? It's just pink. The fungus itself is pink. It makes a, a you know, that's its color. It, it makes a pigment that is pink. So, yeah, fungi are just plain all the time. <laughs> you can get a lot of colors out of them. You know, you're, when you're talking about blue stain or green stain fungi that stain lumber, the, those. The, and the fruiting bodies of those are blue or green or um, fusaria makes some lovely rose colored things and some purple colored things sometimes. So um, there, there are a lot of colors in fungi once in a while. So, but the, the bot, that is the, the fungus, the spores, they, in, in mass, they are pink, pale pink, but yeah. Does the tree tap, does the fungus have to be wounded before it can get it? Or that's easier. Yeah, that's easier. But if it just lands on there, can it start? Um, if it lands on really, really, really soft tissue, maybe. But if, if it lands just on the, like the hard, dry trunk of a tree, no. It's not, I don't think it's going to do anything. So it's going to need some water to germinate and get going and infect. So and it, it doesn't. it's not going to go through hard tissue very easily. So, yeah. These funguses, um, if you take out the tree, are they still in the soil? So you shouldn't plant another palm tree in the area. Or no, this matter? one, this one is some some fungi do do that, but this one isn't really that that bad. So you need to know which one it is and check. That makes it a little easier. Yeah. So basically, not persistent in soil. Correct. Correct. There it is. There's our, there's the culture plate of it. And again, the colors don't always photograph so well, but it is the same dusty rose color. And there's the spores. 
That's the committee of four, the structure that's making the spores, and then here's the spores. And the reason it's not penicillium anymore is they decided that all the penicillium spores are perfectly round. And these other things, they're not perfectly round, they're more oval. So then they moved it out of penicillium and they put it in glioclavium, and now it's in the lanthamala. But <laughs> Still the same thing, still the same fungus, it's still pink. So there's, there's pink rot. The, it's probably the, one of the most common things we see on palms. All right, here's, here's the bad one. Here's the one that we don't want to see at all. They first found this one in San Diego County in the 1970s. And this is Fusarium wiltup palms. Um, so Remember the Iran hostage crisis at all? You guys might actually remember this stuff. <laughs> but remember when the Iran hostage crisis happened and they put those 80, you know, they held them, Iran held American people hostage for, for like a couple of years. It was yeah. a very long time. And there were about 80 of them. Well, they planted palm trees in Mission Bay, in Mission Bay Park, one for each hostage. Only they planted Washingtonia palms and there was fusarium in the soil or phoenix palms and guess what happened to them all they all died <laughs> in the early 90s then when I started they were calling and going oh all our palm trees are dying come look and this is what they had that was my one of my first experiences with fusarium wilt of palm trees and uh, a lot of times you'll see a um, it's uneven when you get fusarium wilt. It's in, it works the same way on a tomato plant too, though those are different fusaria. But you'll see an uneven, you know, one side will still be looking good, but one side will be looking bad. And you're like, what is this? So any kind of uneven thing, the first thing I think of, of course, is who sprayed it with what, you know. Yeah. <laughs> did, the, did the weed care guy spray that side with herbicides? But yeah. Is there can you give an explanation for why it, it's one-sided? Does it have to do with the, with the circulation? Yes. Um, it maybe will attack part of the one side of the tree. Right. It may have, it's where the fungus entered the tree. Now, it can enter through the roots. If your soil is infected, um, it can enter through the roots. And it might have just entered through, you know, a root down there. And then because of the way palms vascular system is, it's going to go right up that. And so it's going to stay in a linear manner, but it's going to keep working up that one side that it's on until it gets to the top and then it'll take over the other side. Or it will continue if it's gradually working its way around through the roots. It'll gradually kind of keep moving around the trunk in the same pattern. Or if it was introduced on a saw, if, if it came in on a pruning wound, and you know the first cuts you made inoculated it there and then after that the saw was kind of cleaned off and when you did this side it you know it didn't inoculate the tree so it all depends on where it got introduced to the tree and how so you said the ones in mission bay that was in the soil when they planted it well i i don't know for sure but it's certainly there now this is one of those that once it's introduced into your soil it's there forever so do not plant another Phoenix canariensis in that soil. So it will die. Yeah. yeah will they be able to do like they did with tomatoes and hybridize it out? Well, I hope so. But boy, um, hybridizing palm trees is a long, slow process. You know, with tomatoes, you can get a couple generations a year, and it goes faster. But hybridizing Phoenix canariensis to do that is I would think it would be possible eventually, but it's going to be slow. So, yeah. If you were to plant tomatoes in the same ground, could you get some cesarean wilt no. on your tomatoes? It's a different kind. No, it's a different kind. Yeah, this, you know, this one only goes to um, Phoenix species, the one we have here. They have a couple of different strains in Florida. There are reports of it going to Washingtonia here. But I have not actually seen it on Washingtonia here. Now, Florida's got, Florida has another strain that attacks queen palms. So, and we're hoping we never get that one. But it, it appears to be an introduced pathogen. 
So, because the first time we ever knew about it was the 1970s. Is that, is that related to lethal yellowing? No. no, that one is one we do not have in North America at this time, we hope. <laughs> and that's a bacterial disease, and it's transmitted by a leafhopper called Mindus crudus, which we also do not have here at this time. So if we ever got the vector and then, you know, the pathogen, but I think they've got that one in Texas and Florida. Right, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, you know, we'd have to get both the insect and, and the bacterium, but... <coughs> Stranger things have happened. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. So, fusarium will, really bad. Um, typical symptoms include um, a browning of the vascular tissue. And again, this can be, several other things can do that. You can see browning with pink rot. You can see browning with a couple more diseases we'll talk about. So, that's not the only thing to think about but one-sided browning of the frond. And I think I've got one here that's got it, that did have the disease. Um, it starts at the bottom. It'll start at the, where it attaches to the trunk. And it'll work, work its way up and round one side of the frond. It always goes in that same linear fashion. And it'll work its way up one side of the frond. It'll turn brown. And then when it gets to the top, it'll start working the brown back down this side, this way and then go back down. So that's a unique pattern that's unique to fusarium, pretty much. Though some of the other diseases can give you what looks like a one-sided browning at first, but only fusarium will do this true thing that starts on one side, goes to the top, and works right back down again. So and it'll just keep doing that and working its way up the trunk till it kills the tree, till it kills all the leaves off. Is there a treatment? No, once you've got it, get rid, of the tree. get rid of the tree. Yeah. Did you say that only attacks, affects the phoenix? Yes. The one we have here only goes to phoenix species. Now, it'll go to all of them, phoenix, robolini, you know. It, and we have a quarantine in the state of California against moving some of these palm trees into the date palm growing regions, our date production areas of Riverside and Imperial counties. You're not supposed to take you know, palms or their soil into those areas. So because if you got into the date palm growing areas, guess what? No more dates. Because it's gonna kill the trees. So that and that quarantine is still in existence even though when they first put the quarantine in place it, the disease was just like in San Diego County. But now it's pretty much over the rest of California but and Nevada. But well, um, thank you people from because I know with the citrus trees, I've been in a nursery here and there and seen the blue stickers and people, when green, whatever it was, nursery was over there by Lake Hodges, put the citrus in their car and drive it up to Temecula, which is in Riverside. How, how do you stop that? Yeah, it, you don't really. Because there's no signs in the nurseries, do not take this out of this area. Mm -hmm. It's on the tags that nobody looks at. Right. Right, and all I can do is, you know, keep talking about it and keep promoting awareness of it that if you move these trees and they are in infected soil, you know, and then you plant it right in that date palm plantations and hopefully those date palm growers have security too of some way to keep it out. It just seems though, like with all this stuff, if you guys keep preaching to the yeah. choir and so do we, the people that are doing it aren't being told. Yeah, they don't care, yeah. It's, it's when you can get, well, we had one um, I think it was a big retail uh, group that was taking the blue tags off the citrus plants. You know, they were like, we don't care, we're taking them all off. And we caught them. They got a really big fine from USDA. So um, if, you, if, if you get those, you know, few exceptions, those big blatant things, you know, you kind of try to make an example and hope you can stop it or slow it down. But yeah, it's kind of inevitable because we think that you know the Nevada infestations came from California possibly the Florida ones did too so yeah people just need to be a lot smarter about well and realize that their plants get sick too and these are fatal diseases and they you know Phoenix canariensis to me is kind of an endangered species in California because of these various diseases does it spread other than on chainsaws and in soil not easily, no. 
No, not really. I mean, if you had water moving soil down the road or, you know, down onto another place, it could move with the water that way. But no, it's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Yeah, this is not a fungus that blows in the wind. It, when it makes spores, it makes, they're in a kind of a sticky, gooey matrix. They're kind of sticky. So they do not easily blow in the wind. So, you know, I, I've heard some landscapers tell me, oh, no, it's not our chainsaws, it's the birds. The birds are doing it. I kind of don't think so. <laughs> Number one, this fungus, you know, if a bird was landing, you know, on a palm and then moved flying to another palm, this fungus lives inside the tissue, in the vascular tissue. So I don't even know how the spores would get on a bird's feet very well. So, oh, it's seaborne also. So if you harvest seeds from that tree and then plant them. And I think that's how we've had it in a few nurseries recently. That seems to be increasing. And I think somebody is harvesting and selling seed from infected trees. They may not even know the trees are infected yet. Or they may have you know, pruned off all the branches and, OK, now it looks good. <laughs> but um, we are seeing it pop up in nurseries. And so anyway, there's another example of it. That's actually, this is in our county, you know. <laughs> that was Santa Barbara County, but there's an infected tree right in the middle of a nursery. Yeah, that tree wasn't for sale, but um, the, the soil in the nursery stock around the tree might end up with fusarium in it. So. so can the soil, like from those plants, carry it? And if you had that palm in your yard, they could get it that way, but that plant wouldn't get it? Or would the yeah. soil have to actually be put around the palm tree? I think it would have to be actually put around the palm tree. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm, that's, that's real gray. I don't think anybody's ever worked on that. But we know, like up at the um, UC Irvine Field Station up there, where Howard Orr, who did a lot of this original work, he was an extension plant pathologist on UC Riverside, and he had some plots up there. And um, now he's been retired for many years, and, and the trees that he worked on have all been gone for 20 or 30 years. And then the other day, well, a few years ago, Jim Downer from, um, from Ventura County. He's, he's got the same job that Dave Shaw used to have here. He started a new work on palm tree thing, and um, they put it in the same plot that Howard Orr used to have, and this tree started dying. And they were like, oh, where is this coming from? And it turned out they went back to the records, and that was the same plot that the original work had been done on, and it was still in the soil there. So. It's, it's long-lived in the soil. Just assume it's going to be there a long time. So, and there is the actual fungus. Um, Fusaria makes three or four different kinds of spores, depending on, and most of them are just these kind of, you know, clear, oval, not real descriptive things. They're, they're kind of hard to identify. You know, a lot of fungi make spores like that. But if you get these kind of canoe-shaped th things, then you know you've got a fusarium. And nothing else makes a spore like that. So that one, it's fairly easy to identify, especially if you can find the canoes. <coughs> Excuse me. There are a lot of different kinds of fusarium. So if it's really, really, really important, you know, if I've got one where, you know, the symptoms are consistent like this, it came from a homeowner, you know, I'm getting fusarium spores like crazy out of it. You know, I'm, I'm done, that's the way we used to do it. But now when you're talking about a nursery situation where we're finding it in nurseries, and that's what happens to the nursery stock when we find it, they have to destroy it. So a lot of them just bury it on their property, which I go, oh, you know, you're contaminating all your soil there, but. <laughs> um, we, they have a new test, a PCR test, a DNA type test now that confirms the type of fusarium exactly. <coughs> yes? What would be the preferred method of disposing of this yeah. Well, burning would be great. <laughs> yeah, which you know, you're know you not going to be able to do very much. For, for a nursery with a lot of plants like that, pretty much they're stuck burying it. So you should have, hardly get burn permits. But just to go back to the taxonomy of fusarium for a little bit. 
This is Fusarium oxysporum forma specialis canariensis, which means it goes to Canary Island date palms and nothing else. So the one on, um, like, tomato is going to have a different form of specialis, and they don't go to any other host but that. So, and so yeah. you would find the spores in the vascular tissue, like if you looked at tomatoes or something? Uh, yes. If, you, if you're doing tomatoes, you would actually, in a tomato, I would culture it out. Because that's pretty soft tissue, and, and you can culture it out fairly easily. With all the palms I get every year, and I get a lot of them, if it's a nursery, we'll culture it. But for all these landscape guys who bring in, you know, 20 or 30 samples at a time, <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it's a lot. So um, if I did that, I'd have cultures all over the place, and, you know, we're on a budget. You, you know, you, you got to come up with ways to do things inexpensively. And um, so I do the, the um, if, you, if I was in a university, yeah, I'd culture it, and I would, um, but since we're on a budget, and, and I would have a moist chamber, you can get this to come out in a moist chamber in a university of a fancy chamber that puts dew on it and everything. My, my moist chamber basically is a plastic bag with a wet paper towel in there. <laughs> and you would be amazed at the things you can get out just using that technique. Because a lot of these fungi fruit under our com conditions of high humidity, I don't want free water in there, but I want high humidity. And it works great. You know, a couple days in there with, in a nice, very humid environment, and, and the fungus just comes ripping right out of the tissue. So, does yeah. It, does it grow under the paper towel or just come out on the plant? No, it just comes out on the plant and stays on the plant. Yeah, it doesn't grow on the paper towel. But, because it eats the sugars, I think, from the plant. But, um, so for when you've got a lot of samples and no money to work with them very much, um, it works great. So for the landscape situation, it's it's a very good method. And I use that on a lot of different things. So, and it actually brings out all the other fungi that we're going to talk about, too. So, so this is a good place to take a break. Do you guys want to take your break here? Okay.